So I recently watched a video by a Protestant YouTuber who decided to follow his ecumenical instinct and attend mass. So he attended both the extraordinary form and the ordinary form and then shared his thoughts about it afterwards. And if I can remember to, I'll try to link that video in the description of my YouTube video. And he shared an interesting anecdote of his experience. And, and keep in mind that this is a person who is not motivated by hostility. This is someone who is genuinely exploring Catholicism. And if Chesterton's right, the moment a person stops pulling away from Catholicism is the moment they start to feel a tug towards it. So after attending both forms, the extraordinary and the ordinary, and then sharing his experience of that, in the comments on his video, and perhaps even anecdotally with the people that he was interacting with, he immediately became aware of the deleterious effects and conflict between those two apparent factions, or factions that could maybe be represented by those who prefer a traditional form of the liturgy, and those who prefer a more contemporary rendering of it. And he took the time to point out that this infighting that he perceived as a first impression was a major turnoff for him. And this underscored something that is so critical for me, which is that a house divided cannot stand. A house that is fraught with infighting is going to amputate whatever appeal possessed an outsider to come visit in the first place. These divisions exist and they desperately need to be addressed in order to be resolved. And this young man's experience in his video reinforces that for me, which is why I'm revisiting this topic in this video. We won't find the unity that we need in order to answer the church's high calling in its mission by ignoring it or refusing to talk about it. The only way to heal those divisions is to seek unity in Christ who is the truth. We need to spend the necessary time to discover what that truth is and, and to allow ourselves to be conformed to it rather than asserting our own truth and preferences. We need to be conformed to it rather than to trying to conform the truth to ourselves. When I was first exploring Christianity as a potential convert, I remember somebody saying to me that Jesus never sinned. And as a descendant of a post-Christian society, I was familiar enough with biblical stories that I thought I knew what I was talking about. So I quickly replied, oh yeah, what about that time he beat a bunch of people up outside the temple, right? Huh? Because I was raised to believe that fighting was bad and I was especially reminded of this every time I got into a fight as a kid. And as far as I know, at least where I live, whipping people with a rope out in public, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's illegal. What I hadn't considered is that God's law is above human law. And if there's a justifiable reason to turn to violence, then maybe it's not a sin. So if Jesus is God the Son, and there's no way that he can sin against his own nature, what was it that was so justifiable that could move him to violence? What were the people on the receiving end of this outburst doing that was so bad that in our Lord's mind, it would be better for them to go down in history as the ones who provoked the Prince of Peace to violence rather than continue doing what they were doing? Well, they had set up a bit of a marketplace where they were buying and selling livestock and exchanging money. Now, if you're a communist, you might be thinking, yeah, take that capitalism. But the problem is, is that Jesus spent a lot of time in other marketplaces and didn't exhibit that same instinct for violence. And he also told parables that involved laborers and employers and investors and didn't hint any sort of projection of condemnation towards them. So it wasn't that they were trading in a marketplace that was the object of his anger. It's that they were doing something profane in a sacred place. Now profane here means like the everyday or the secular. They were treating the sacred in a casual way. Think about that for a second. Of all the sins that Jesus encountered in his earthly life, he was never so put out than when he encountered irreverence for a sacred place. So what does this have to do with music? Well, if we're gonna incorporate music into our worship, then I think the first thing we need to do as a priority is be mindful of the need for sacredness. The church is the new temple. It's the new place where God dwells in a substantial way. It is a holy and sacred place. And the etymology of that word sacred means to be set apart. It should be set apart and distinct from the secular. In every way that it announces itself to our intellect and to our senses, it should be different from what we encounter in the secular or profane aspects of life. And this goes for music. Keep in mind, we don't need to be using music in mass. We could just say the prayers without the music. 
Music is only introduced based on the assumption that it can be used to enhance what we're doing. So if it is going to be incorporated in, it better be done so in such a way that actually does enhance the sacredness of the place and the actions that we're committed to. And it's definitely not meant to entertain or to amuse us. It's not some musical interlude between the prayers. It's the prayers themselves that are supposed to be sung. But if we use a style of music that is born out of a secular culture for commercial purposes, which is what popular music is, then we end up disregarding, and I would say undermining, the sacredness of what we're trying to do. We're introducing a profane element into a sacred act, and in so doing, we end up distorting or concealing the sacredness of it. And if you think I'm getting too carried away with this analogy of the profane and the sacred and the cleansing of the temple, you should know that Pope St. Pius X used it in his Motu Proprio Tralia Solicitudini, which was an instruction about how to incorporate music into Mass. And I'll just read that excerpt. He said, It is vain to hope that the blessing of heaven will descend abundantly upon us when our homage to the Most High, instead of ascending in the odor of sweetness, puts in the hand of the Lord the scourges wherewith of old the divine redeemer drove the unworthy profaners from the temple. And then he goes on to say that sacred music must exclude all profanity, not only in itself, but in the manner in which it is presented by those who execute it. In other words, the music in its content and in its character has to be sacred. Commercial genres like pop, rock, and folk are by their very nature, their history, and their inception profane. To try to wedge them into the sacred, the sacred liturgy is to risk that same kind of divine wrath that was displayed by Jesus in the Gospels. It is vain arrogance on our part. Not only should it be sacred, but it should also be universal. It should transcend the particular preferences of a place or a group or a society. Now why? because the liturgy belongs to all of us. It isn't contingent upon a particular place or attitude or cultural persuasion. And in just a pragmatic way, think about it. Commercial music is designed to offer a diverse range that will appeal to a variety of appetites so that we all can get tickled in our own way. It, it, con it concedes that what appeals to one person isn't going to appeal to everybody. So it offers that, that wide variety to maximize its commercial potential. But if liturgy is supposed to unite us in that work of prayer, then choosing from among that, that cafeteria of genres is the worst way to create that unity and that inclusion. You will never find a genre that will have universal appeal. Not only will it not have universal appeal, but it will have the potential to distract and disrupt the prayer of many people, which is why whenever I walk into a church and I see a guitar and percussion ensemble ready to rock, I know that it's going to be a major distraction for me, even if I happen to like it. Instead, we need to disregard this whole notion of trying to choose a genre based on its apparent popular appeal in the commercial marketplace. In fact, I would say we need to disregard genres altogether and instead pick something that is specifically designed for Christian prayer, something that is set apart for that purpose. And according to Pope St. Pius X, as well as Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is the Second Vatican Council's document on the liturgy, these qualities that I've been describing, universality and sacredness, are found in the highest degree in Gregorian chant. Pope St. Pius goes on to say that it is the supreme model for sacred music. And reading that thing is always kind of shocking to me because I went to Mass for years and years before reading that and never once heard Gregorian chant come from the music leaders. Not only did I attend Mass for several years, but for the most part in the preliminary years of my conversion, I was leading music at Mass with a guitar-based band and praise and worship, which was modeled after those popular commercial forms of music. And I hate to think that my attitude, which showed preference for the kind of music that I enjoyed in my leisure time, in my secular life, might have repelled people from coming to Mass. I was imposing my own secular tastes in a sacred context, such that people either had to get over it and try not to be distracted by it, or if it really was a problem, they had to go somewhere else. The sacred liturgy should be inclusive and it should never impose those kinds of dilemmas on people. And if we just followed the instructions of the church, we wouldn't have these kinds of problems. 
Now, I know that this is difficult for a lot of people to hear. If someone had said this to me back when I was strumming my guitar every week at mass, I probably wouldn't have received it very well. So I don't offer this as a condemnation, but rather an invitation for all of us to better learn our faith and the sacredness of the liturgy and what it means to appreciate God's presence there. And if we can respond to that in a positive and meaningful way, then I think that we as a church will be poised to do a lot of good in the world, which is currently very deeply divided. And no wonder, God is the source of unity for the world and the church is his messenger. But how can we be a source of healing and unity for the world if we as a house are currently divided? If nothing else, this is an invitation to end the conflict and the liturgy wars that exist within the church by simply conforming ourselves to the church's instruction. It really is that simple. Thank you so much for watching that. I really hope that you enjoyed it and that you got something out of it. And if you did and you want to consume more content like this, then please consider subscribing to my channel. Or if you saw this on Facebook, then like my page and follow along. If you're on YouTube, it's not enough anymore to subscribe because YouTube wants to think that it can tell you what you should watch instead of what you actually want to watch. So in this case, you actually have to hit that little bell to be notified as to whether or not I've uploaded something more recently. So please subscribe and hit the bell at the same time that really helps me out a lot and if you could consider sharing this among your social network that helps me a lot too and if you want to support the making of these videos please consider supporting my business which is a communications and strategic marketing company who specializes especially in branding and web design and this is especially catered towards ministries and apostolates and parishes we have a parish web design system that we've built specifically for parishes and churches that is affordable but also beautifully packaged and easy to use. So if you're interested in that, check out my business, which is holdsworthdesign.com and hit the contact uh, button in the navigation and get in touch and, and we can figure out if there's a good fit for you there.